We are so, so thrilled that you're here tonight for the Diversity at the Frontier Gender Equality in Space Conference Signature Event. Now, for those of you who haven't been part of our wonderful uh, event and conference that we have had all day today, as well as workshops that were held yesterday with the ACT government, I am so thrilled to tell you that this is the first event of its kind in Australia, an event where we can draw a line in the sand and mark a time for which diversity and inclusion, belonging, equity and equality are foregrounded as significant priorities in the space sector where we can embed them well on into the future. I'm Dr. Elise Stevenson. I'm the Deputy Director of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership here at the ANU and one of the organisers of this conference together with my colleagues, Dr. Cassandra Steer and Professor Meredith Nash. The Global Institute for Women's Leadership is a research institute that was founded and is chaired by our former, first and only female Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. It exists to be uh, a leading institute around gender equality and women's leadership across all kinds of different spheres and workplaces, not just here in Australia, but also globally. We exist to create an evidence base, one that is intersectional, that considers gender as a spectrum that looks at race and ethnicity, disability, uh, LGBTIQ plus status and much more. We, together with ANU Institute for Space, have partnered and come together to create this con conference to really meet a gap in our conversations and dialogue, our policy and our action here in Australia, and also to be part of a leading conversation globally. We are so thrilled that we were able to put on this event with the wonderful support of the ACT government as our major sponsor, who have really demonstrated through their support their values-aligned commitment to the space sector. And I'm very thrilled that we'll also be hearing from the Chief Minister a little bit later this evening. We also have the support of the Australian Space Agency, thank you, and as we heard from today, uh, the Australian Space Agency has committed to producing a diversity and inclusion statement for the space sector, which we are very, very thrilled to lead here. We also give our thanks to the US Embassy in Australia and the US government for their ongoing support and commitment and partnership to bilateral strength around diversity and inclusion in space. To the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, who really act as a leading body internationally and who are well recognised as leaders in gender equality in all kinds of international affairs, and to the Australian Academy of Sciences for their support in venue uh, and, and spaces today. Now, on March 25, 2019, NASA announced it would launch its first all-female spacewalk of two women at the International Space Station. Days after the announcement was made, the space walk, this historic spacewalk, was cancelled because there weren't enough uniforms or, or spacesuits to fit the women. Now, months later, the historic walk did take place, but the incident highlighted the gender gap that remains in space. Now, given Space 2.0 is bringing unprecedented opportunities for nations and building on humanity's first endeavours to reach space by increasing accessibility, increasing the, the actors, um, improving technology, uh, and, and really rapidly building on growth in the space industry, we must be very intentional in ensuring that our technological progress does not outpace our social uh, values. Right, we've got to get it right from the start. Whilst we know that women's inclusion in international affairs results in better decision making and higher levels of collaboration and consensus, and the business case for diversity has well and truly been made, um, increased productivity, innovation, reducing groupthink, uh, we've, we've gone through it all in extensive detail today. Currently, this business case, whether on moral or strategic grounds, is not guaranteed progress that we are seeing to date is not guaranteed. So I'm very thrilled that we are able to hold this event and I'm deeply grateful to you all for turning up here tonight. To start off this evening, it is really important that we acknowledge the space in which we gather and the deep history that has come with this land. I think that it is really imperative that we do not repeat the mistakes of, this, of the past when it comes to the space sector. 
With that in mind, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Auntie Matilda House, um, Dr. Auntie Matilda House, who will be joining us here today to give the welcome to country. Remember years and years ago, when all you kids, you'd remember Andrew Barr, when you was a kid, you used to rush home to watch Lost in Space. <laughs> Do you all remember that? It's the age group of Andrew Barr now. <laughs> Come on, you got to admit it. That's what we're all here tonight, to learn from that robot. What did it say every time? Come on. Do you know? Thank you, thank you, thank you. God. And here we are. Here we are. But only this time it's diversity. To making sure everybody, everybody is going to be part of that whole uniformed, um, what you are all doing. And I believe that you should go to everywhere around Australia to promote this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing what you are doing tonight. Lost in Space may have been great then, as my kids were watching that all the time, but who would have thought? And then, then come that other big show, you know? I don't know. But anyways, but here we are in Australia and leading, we're leading the nations because it was just said about the United States and others that are going to be joining and giving us help to maintain and always be there for us if, you know, if needed. But having women standing side by side is what we always want, to make sure that the diversity is there for the, all the agendas, male and female, because this is what we need and we have been getting it, but not as much as what we do in this subject of Lost in Space. How many people have ever been lost? I've been lost in space. I've been running around all bloody day with a seven-year-old. <laughs> and, <I laughs> and my great-granddaughter. And oh my God, I'm so tired. And I want to apologise that as soon as I'm finished, I'm out the door. Sorry. I really am sorry. But she'll be waiting up for me to come home and... Um, that's what, we, that's what we do as parents, grandfathers, grandmothers, great grannies, which I am. And that's what I'll be doing. I'm sorry, but I'm going to leave you to Andrew Barr <laughs> and all the things that he knows about Lost in Space because, you know, we have the most wonderful, wonderful station that we have here in Australia and that's on our land, on the land of my land, the Nambri people, out there tipping Billa. Um, is it still there, Andrew? It is. Well, could have could have went off, lost in space. Who knows? And then out, and then out at that other place out there, because when I was on the Heritage Council, we used to visit that as well. So yes, the Australian Capital Territory has been involved and will always be involved. And that makes me a very proud Canberran. It makes me a very proud Canberran to know that we are part and parcel of everything that's happening here tonight and other space ships that are flying around as well. Have a great evening, enjoy yourselves, and get lost in space. <laughs> Amazing. I think that that is probably the best welcome to country I've, I've ever heard. So I think um, get lost in space, everyone. Um, 
It is my greatest honour to be able to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Mr Andrew Barr has led a positive agenda for Canberra since being elected ACT Chief Minister in 2014. He has improved the lives of Canberrans through major changes to the ACT's tax system, leading the nation on climate action, reaching 100% renewable electricity and making Canberra the most LGBTIQ plus friendly city in Australia. Andrew has... <laughs> Andrew has outlined his economic priorities in Canberra Switched On, which builds on Canberra's status as a progressive and sustainable city that values people and ideas. The innovative and diverse business ecosystem that is developed under his leadership provides a strong foundation for the ACT to achieve and drive these priorities forwards. We're so honoured to have you. Over to you, uh, Chief Minister. Thank you very much, Elise, for that uh, very generous introduction. I noticed no one applauded tax reform, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the treasurer in me is, is used to that. Uh, can I uh, thank Aunty Matilda too for the uh, welcome to country, although she perhaps might have slightly aged me a little. I think Lost in Space was on its 10th repeat by the time uh, I was coming home to watch. More of a Doctor Who and Star Trek guy myself. But can I thank the uh, Global Institute for Women's Leadership, the ANU, uh, the various Australian government and US government agencies for their support of this event. Uh, and we're delighted as a territory government to be uh, a major sponsor. The, the origins of this uh, in some regards stem back to an Australian Space Awards event that uh, had amongst the worst gender balance of any event I've attended this century. Uh, and in talking with Kate Lundy and others that night, I said, we need to do something about this. And this is a magnificent opportunity for the ACT to again show national leadership. So that's why uh, I am here. That's why we as a government are sponsoring this event. Uh, and that's what I want to talk to you um, about tonight. This is a wonderful opportunity, not just this evening's event, but the, uh, uh, the number of days associated with the conference to, to bring together the local industry, academia, peak bodies, and the wider community to engage and to find some solutions to a pretty stark gender imbalance in the space industry. And it is stark. I'm advised that of the 566 people who have traveled into space, not even 12% of them have been women. Currently, only one in five of the jobs in the space sector are held by women. There is still a very persistent gendered use of language when talking about matters space, from one giant leap for mankind to unmanned aircraft. The language that we use is important and it does reflect the challenges but I think also the opportunities that we now have. We know there's a lot of work to be done, but I'm confident that Canberra's space industry provides a strong base for which to lead that work across our country. Now, this city has had a long and direct involvement with some of the biggest events in international space exploration, from providing critical support to the Apollo 11 missions to the Phoenix landing on Mars. Uh, 1973, and I think the ABC have been reporting on this today, uh, was when one of the deep space dishes at, at Tidbinbilla that Auntie Matilda referred to was opened by then Prime Minister Gough Whitlam. As to whether it is looking better than this 1973 deep dish is another matter, but uh, we're both in need of some, uh, some midlife repairs, but I think it demonstrates a long run commitment and history for, for this city. And this, this reflects now in what we see in 2023, that our space industry is uniting players across government, across industry, our education institutions, and our research community. We have deep connections at all levels of government, academia, research institutions, and out into the business community, small and large, with an aligned agenda common goals for where we want to take and develop our local space industry. Our city is home to two of Australia's leading space research institutions. 
They've been consistently developing spin-off companies that have been producing commercially viable products that are at the cutting edge of technology and research. Our space facilities in Canberra are key enablers of future space missions. They're able to meet and provide professional mission assurance standards and principles, unlike anywhere else in our nation. So this is an ecosystem that can provide end-to-end -end capability for design, manufacture, operation, test, verification and delivery of a full range of space products and services. And because of all of this alignment uh, and capability, our, our industry capability is internationally renowned. Our research and education institutions, our innovative local businesses, our global exporters are making a significant contribution to the Australian and to the international industry. So there is a real sense of momentum at this point in time and excitement around the range of projects and opportunities that are being undertaken in Canberra. But one thing is holding us back, and it is clear that to continue this growth, we need to diversify and expand the space workforce. We know that increasing diversity will bring new ideas and voices into this ecosystem and will lead to better outcomes for our community, for our economy and for our environment. We know that the space industry uh, is experiencing the same sorts of skill shortages and challenges that so many parts of the Australian economy are currently experiencing. The unemployment data that came out today showed this, this little territory has the lowest unemployment rate in Australia. And we have nearly twice as many job vacancies as there are unemployed people in Canberra at the moment. So we have what economists would call an acute skill shortage and full employment. Now, there's always something wrong in the economy. That is a, a fact, it's a pretty dismal science economics. But this is perhaps the sort of problem you want to have. There's a lot of demand for skills and some amazing opportunities for our education institutions uh, and many of the partners within this space ecosystem if we get this right to be a real powerhouse in our nation. Greater diversity and equality of access have to be at the centre of our collective effort to build and maintain a skilled workforce into the future. So we're keenly aware of the benefits and the need to diversify, and that's why we bring this values-based approach to space industry development in Canberra. We think this approach is responsible, it's sustainable, but most importantly, it is equitable. We seek to promote a culture that provides equitable access, that encourages women, young people, and First Nations people into long-term rewarding careers in the space industry. So we want space to be a viable and obvious career pathway. We want people to be challenged, to be interested. We want them to be involved. And we want voices heard and contributions valued. Now for many people, the journey to space starts at school. So that's why the ACT government has established an Academy of Future Skills, which is providing our teachers and our schools with additional support in STEM education. We're providing grants to schools to support more young women and girls to get involved in subjects that they are underrepresented in and where we know the jobs of tomorrow are going to require those skills. But I think the commitment needs to extend beyond schools and into the workforce and the broader economy. So we're committed to inclusive innovation and knowledge-based economic growth. And to achieve those goals, diversity is at the heart of delivery. Now, innovation flourishes in our city because we're connected. It's relatively easy to build networks in this city. And our diversity and our progressive values mean more and more that Canberra is a focal point and a place that people are drawn to as a centre of inclusive innovation. And these are the, the priorities and the values that, that underpin our switched on economic development strategy. This sets out some short term priorities for 
well, when, I, when I released it in uh, several years ago for the first half of this decade, but sets a platform for where we want to take the space industry as part of Canberra's knowledge economy. We're going to further this work uh, through the release of a specific space industry strategy this year. And so the ideas and input that comes from this conference will be important in shaping that document. But we want the strategy to focus on promoting a culture that offers fair access, that encourages people of diverse backgrounds uh, into space careers, but also understands and seeks to focus on some specific groups to address gender imbalance, to support a pathway for younger people and to particularly focus on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices and economic participation. So we seek to support and encourage this through education and training pathways, as I've touched on at schools, but also in higher education settings. And I think we need to measure and track our progress. If you can't measure and demonstrate improvement, we're not pursuing the right policy agenda. And so I, I look to the Australian STEM Equity Monitor to give us a, a sense of the current state of gender equity uh, in this area. It's a pretty reliable measure of changes and trends. And what it's showing pre-pandemic anyway, was that women made up less than a quarter of students studying STEM subjects in 2019. So I go back to the point about one in five jobs in space and now at only one in four uh, uh, of the students studying quite relevant subjects for a career in this industry, only one in four were women in 2019. Five years after graduating, men with a STEM qualification were nearly two times more likely to be working in an occupation that required those STEM skills compared to their female counterparts. And there was, and this will surprise none in the room, a significant gender pay gap between qualified men and women working in STEM areas uh, that in 2020 was nearly $30,000 per annum. So that's a pretty stark set of figures, data, and provides us with a challenge, but also a pretty clear pathway to how we can address these imbalances. Clearly starts at school. Higher education provides a wonderful opportunity to quickly bridge a gap. And then there is a real onus on employers in this area to address the gender pay gap. So attracting women and girls to STEM, providing an environment for them to thrive is a shared responsibility. It's one that we take on as a major provider of education and training in our city, but we will need partners. We will need businesses to sign up to this. So there's a lot of work to do in short, but it's important that we're talking about it. We know the gaps we need to close we know the areas we need to focus on. And with support from our level of government, from the Commonwealth government, from all of the institutional partners within our space ecosystem, and with some really amazing role models already thriving in the space sector, I'm confident we can get there and hopefully get there really soon. So I'm asking you all to join us in this endeavour. It will only happen through collective effort and action and goodwill. Let's make it happen. Thank you for being part of tonight. Well, there's the call to action. Thank you so much, Chief Minister. And now it is my utmost pleasure to be able to introduce to you our wonderful speakers for tonight. Um, I will introduce our speakers and I would encourage them to walk up to the stage and I will join them and we'll have a bit of a moderated discussion covering a little bit about what we discussed here today but also what are the critical messages that are needed going forwards. So firstly I'm very honoured to be able to introduce um, the ambassador, Australia's ambassador for gender equality, Stephanie Copas Campbell, as one of our honoured guests tonight. Thank you so much Stephanie for joining us. We <laughs> Thank you. 
We are also very, very honoured to be joined um, by an amazing First Nations PhD candidate who is working on the space sector and space sector's relationship and engagement with First Nations communities, particularly around launch and launch sites, uh, Carolyn Craven. All the way from the United States, we are also very, very honoured here to have tonight the very first Gender Advisor for Women, Peace and Security to the United States Space Force, Lieutenant Colonel Kristen Clark. So, so today, I'm assuming people can hear me. Um, great. <laughs> Today, we learned all kinds of things. Um, we learned that progress is not guaranteed. We learned, and Chief Minister has repeated now, that women still only represent one in five in the industry or the wider space sector. And also that that has been the case for over 30 years. Um, we know that space is everywhere. We know that the technologies that we use on a day-to-day -day basis from GPS to, to memory foam um, to artificial limbs and all other things are all around us. We're not just talking about space as something that is up in the sky. It is down here and our sector and technologies uh, are, are deeply earth-based. And we also learned that there are a lot of new institutions from United States Space Sports, Australian Space Command, as well as our Australian Space Agency, which means that we have an obligation and an opportunity to get things right from the start. What I want to know, though, is that we are at this moment in time and we have not achieved gender equality still or other forms of diversity and inclusion. We're currently seeing a perpetuation of some of our more Earth-based and historic inequalities in the national space sector and globally. Um, why are we still fighting this battle and what are some of the ramifications for the future? Stephanie, can I throw to you first? Yes, can you hear me? It's wonderful to be here. Good evening. I first want to remark um, the Chief Minister noted that he went to a space conference and it was heavily dominated by men. So I look around this room. And I have to say, it's heavily dominated by women, and that's wonderful. I spent a good deal of my career working um, in the resource sector, trying to give their money to communities, and it was heavily male-dominated. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a moment, because there's a lot of parallels. But I would go to conferences, and I'd be the only woman on stage. I'd be one of the few women in the audiences. And I, I would sit there and say, we need more women, we need more women, we need more women. I'm in this role, and I go to a lot of conferences about women, and I sit and I say, we need more men. We need more men, we need more men. <laughs> um, so it seems to be when we're talking about women, we're often talking to other women. And whilst that's important, we can't in this space achieve gender equality without men. And we can't achieve it without everyone. And so I think the first thing is how do we start to look at this in a, a very inclusive way, in a way that um, when we start to exclude people, when we talk about it, that's where we're also starting to get some of that pushback and we can talk about that a bit more. So thank you to all the men that are here today. It's very important to have you in the room. Um, you know, across the board, I, I often say that with gender equality, it's it's not just the right thing to do, and of course it is, um, women and girls' rights and women and all their diversity and, and the rights, it's human right, it's a universal human right. But it's absolutely the smart thing to do. And I do believe that we need to ensure in all of our conversations, we understand fundamentally why that is the case. We cannot tackle, let's just take climate change, we cannot tackle the sticky, wicked problem of climate change if we are ignoring the contribution that the brain power of half of our planet can make to that. We just can't do it. We are not going to tackle the sticky problem of climate change if we are not looking at the diversity of thinking and innovation of ideas that women and girls bring um, in addition to the different ideas that, that men and boys bring to that. We're not going to tackle it if we don't look at the, the impact and the barriers that tend to be greater um, on women and girls than men and boys in many areas. So we, we just can't have any sort of economic 
social human development. We can't tackle the greatest threats that, that are facing us as humanity without looking and addressing and being serious about gender equality. It underpins everything. So I think having those dialogues in an inclusive way and in doing it in a way um, that we are, are talking about it strategically, um, as well as the human right, but, but strategically is really, really important. Thanks so much, Stephanie. I, I mean, I completely agree. You know, this isn't just a space sector issue, but I think the, the ramifications of getting it wrong and also the opportunity of getting it right are, are really quite critical and, and major. Um, Carolyn, I'm going to go to you. You know, we talked a lot today about the voices that are being heard and the voices that aren't being heard in the space sector. You work particularly with First Nations communities in the space sector around launch and launch sites. Um, how can we make sure that a diversity of people and perspectives are represented, are heard, are listened to, are part of the decision-making tables? What are your perspectives? It's a big question to answer. Um, obviously, First Nations, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have been trying to do this for some time outside of launching. Uh, I guess I have the power to be able to do that within launching and hence this is my focus. I would argue that that needs to be uh, broadened in many areas um, across Australia and lives that are, you know, in our society and where it affects Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander lives, and it does. Um, the best, in terms of answering the question, I think to start off with, we've got to listen. I mean, that's what we're screaming out for. We're screaming out for a voice whether you agree with the voice to parliament, that's a separate issue. It can't be argued though, I think it's not disputed that we would like to be counted equally in, with equality. We want to be heard. Uh, we, uh, it affects us uh, profoundly. Um, it, launching in particular, um, if I look at that, because that's obviously my PhD topic. That will profoundly affect Aboriginal lives and Torres Strait Islanders. It will um, inevitably, it can have a positive outcome if we do it correctly or it can have a negative one if we don't. What I fear is that there is no real governance for that at the moment and there we, have a, we will have the gap and the gap will become bigger as time passes. So we need to capture that now, and I've heard that in speeches, so. Thanks so much, and, and I completely agree. I guess we've got, a, we've got a, a benchmark to go off in terms of the mining sector has, has been there, done that. Um, Colonisation has done absolutely dreadful things to Australia. There's, there's this kind of moment in which we have to be quite reflective and really, yeah, put our ear to the ground, you know, listen to communities and understand uh, their perspectives and also look at um, the critical failures because that, that is ultimately what they have been and there's a lot of similarities in the space sector that I fear that maybe we're not quite good enough yet at, at being able to deal with. Um, Kristen, your position in Space Force is quite historic. It is, it is quite an, you know, a, a remarkable position that we are able to be at this point in time where we have a new institution, and this has been prioritised at the highest levels right from the start. Um, now, you are gender advisor for WIM, Peace and Security in particular, and for those of you who um, may not be so familiar, the United Nations in 2000 uh, issued kind of a, a WIM, Peace and Security, Security Council resolution, which was really uh, a landmark um, you know, international agreement, which basically, for the first time ever, was uh, made the direct link between gender equality and women's representation and inclusion and peace and, and basically recovery post-conflict and the prevention of violence. Now, for you, Kristen, how do you think that things like the Women, Peace and Security agenda pave the way for gender equality in the space sector? Yeah, so first off, thank you for the invite uh, this evening. Um, yeah, uh, came here from, you know, the, from D.C. To, to sit on the panel and, and have all, uh, you know, be in the workshops this week, so I really do appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, the Space Force is, is new, very new. We're, th we're three. 
Uh, so, you know, we're, we're the youngest of the services, we're the smallest of the services by, by far. Um, so we're trying to do it right. Uh, we're trying to, to make sure we get into the, uh, the ground floor um, and have the, you know, someday hopefully the 50-50 split of men, women um, in, in our service. Uh, so that's something that, um, you know, our leadership is striving for. Um, but to do that, we also have to get the word out uh, for the different services. Um, so in response to the 2000, the UN, um, my Congress has then tasked our, all the services to, to implement WPS into, into our, our service. Uh, every service is looking at it differently. Um, the Army, at so much larger than the Space Force, um, has a different way. Uh, but so for us, it's, it's training our senior leaders. It's, it's ensuring that um, we, our most senior leadership, and, and men and women in senior leadership are, are there. Uh, and support WPS, which we've been doing uh, the past couple, couple months uh, really heavy in the Space Force as far as briefing. Uh, but then it's also training our, our folks, um, training the guardians of the Space Force to understand what WPS is and getting in at that ground level to ensure that these uh, ideas of gender equity, getting met, you know, uh, women to the table with a voice, not just at the table, but with a voice, uh, and ensuring that our, our male counterparts listen to us and also provide our junior officers, our junior enlisted, and our, and our young civilians that, that training and that uh, equity at the table. So that's how we're trying to do it in the Space Force. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think it's fantastic. I think that one of the things that always blows my mind about the Wind Peace and Security Agenda is yeah, it's 20 years old and actually really, and, and my colleague uh, Dr. Cassandra Steer and I have been working on kind of how would we translate this agenda to space um, security. And, and there's, there, there is literally no literature in terms of academic research out there that we can find about how we would apply this to space security. So we are really at the frontier of actually, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but what the Women, Peace and Security agenda does allow is for agencies and countries to look internally at their defence workforces, their foreign affairs, you know, um, you know, lots of the elements of their workforces to see, well, are they representative? And when we are negotiating for peace or for, for conflict or for anything in between, that women are in the room. But secondly, that we apply a gender lens to when things go wrong. Um, you know, climate change obviously is a threat multiplier, multiplier for gender inequality. Um, making things much, much worse. But we also see that, you know, when things like satellites are targeted in, in war, that can knock them out. It can have uh, ramifications for civilians and militaries. But we know because of the entrenched gender inequalities in the world that that is likely to have a greater effect on women and girls, particularly when we come to telecommunications, to education, a whole lot of different um, ramifications. So it's, I think it's really remarkable and I think it's, a, it's phenomenal that we do have this commitment from the Space Force. If I can jump to you, Stephanie, because you, you do work a lot in kind of this ambassadorial role and really, um, I suppose, you know, Australia has been seen in many ways as a leader in this space, but what do you think that Australia's role could be when it comes to leading on gender equality, diversity, you know, inclusion and equity in the space sector internationally? And what would you like to see from our international counterparts around this area? So, we, and, and we are a leader. We, we start at home and I love the fact that our Prime Minister very strategically put our Minister for Finance and our Minister for Women in the same position and have started on the front foot addressing gender pay gaps, looking at issues like STEM, um, domestic violence, etc. And that's carried right over into the international setting with our foreign policy, which pursues the, the empowerment of women and girls as a top priority. So within that, we also, of course, um, have signed all five of the core space treaties. I think only a handful of nations have done that. So we are in a powerful position to combine the two priorities, and we're doing so. We um, can play a really important role in multilateral settings and working with like-minded countries, which we do need to bring on board, particularly given in what we're seeing in multilateral settings is a significant and concerning gender pushback in, in language and in international treaties um, and um, in building consensus. And so we, we need to work with like-mindeds and we can have a real voice, um, including in the, in the space and in multilateral and regional forms. 
but importantly through our foreign policy, through our trade policy, through our um, development cooperation, through some of the different ways we're looking at financing um, investment into women's businesses and women's activities. Um, we really can drive women's empowerment, which is the basis for everything we're doing across every space, including um, this particular space. space. Um, and in doing so, we are working through our development cooperation program, for example, to improve access to STEM for, for um, boys and girls, but with, with a, a particular focus on getting more girls into STEM um, and more generally looking um, at, at women's equality. We're working across the business sector, including the tech sector, to look at ways to lift barriers so that more women can participate, et cetera. So I think just starting with championing women's empowerment in everything that we do, which is the basis for everything else, is really important. And of course, we're um, absolute leaders in the women, peace and security space as well. So really, we need, we need more than ever our like-minded partners to work with us to fight hard. I mean, you mentioned in, in your, um, your introductory remarks that we can't assume that progress is linear and we absolutely cannot rest on our laurels. Progress is not linear and that pushback is real and it's frightening. And so in everything we do, we need to work with like-minded and encourage them to step out and to fight for this in every space, in, including space space. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that too. I think that backlash is a is a really important conversation that we perhaps aren't having enough of, but that is is having real um, you know impacts on on all co kinds of um, bodies that have been traditionally marginalised in all kinds of sectors. But I think you know in sectors that have high visibility, like the space sector, there are there are kind of unique um, challenges that come with that high visibility. Um, Carolyn, if I can go to you. So my question comes in two parts here. Firstly, um, thinking about policy, is there any big messages that you would have for, for government or for industry when it comes to First Nations engagement in space sector? And secondly, any advice for young people, um, young First Nations people in particular, in, in joining the space sector? So to start off with the first question, uh, I think that governments have been consulted a lot. I think uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have been talking to governments for a long time and felt like it doesn't get listened to. Now, I understand that hopefully that'll change soon, um, but we don't know yet. And I guess uh, governments probably... I mean, I've worked for governments. I've worked for different tiers of governments in Australia and um, my experience is if we look at one person that's experienced and gone through the system, um, there hasn't been a lot of support to get you there. Uh, and so, I mean, I've got a science background. I've got a hydrogeology background. Um, I'm not in it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a lawyer, but I don't have a practising certificate. There's a reason for that. What we've got to do, and these, these were all in government agencies, so um, we've got to really support women because women, Indigenous women, lead other Indigenous girls slash women through the system and we have more of um, their presence, which means, you know, as we learn today, if we don't have the cohort there, we can't use that as an understanding for anything um, so governments really need to lead the way. Uh, I always say that governments have to set the example because they're the gatekeepers of the country. I mean, they're ultimately the uh, you know, ultimate administrator. So um, it's really their responsibility and they need to do that with honesty and with integrity. So they have to mean it um, and understand the benefits that Indigenous people bring to, the, to, to governments, to space, to science, to, to any area really, but understand what they can bring, not just, um, you know, I guess the tokenism that we are so used to. I would like to see not uh, our people not pigeonholed, you know, um, and actually be in positions of true leadership uh, based on merit so we get to the top 
And we, there's very few of us in leadership positions, which is concerning. Obviously, we don't get to make the decisions for our own people, but also we can help uh, non-Indigenous Australia as well. Uh, we've got lots to contribute there. Um, to answer the second question, well, it kind of feeds into the first question because if you've got lots of, say, women and uh, kids uh, that I know, I've worked in youth justice um, and I've seen once they get in the system and unfortunately we're overrepresented in that system, even from, I mean, in, in, in South Australia, the responsible criminal age of responsibility is from 10. It's way too young. I noticed that the Northern Territory have actually made a change on that. We need to look at that. But we need to look at all the institutionalised laws and policies in place that stop that and get out of that thinking because those kids, once they are in the system, and they might be in the system not at no fault of their own based on this you know, intergenerational trauma, um, they can't get out. And what do we do about that in terms of if they get a record young, even if they get a record young, under the age of 18 and they've been handled with, say, like in South Australia, they didn't go through the um, youth, youth court system, they get diverted into the family conferencing unit, they still have a record with police. Police can still access that record. Their, their career is now over if they want to ever go on the police when they're older. They cannot do that. So there's always that level of discrimination on top of already fundamental discrimination that's already got us there in the first place. Those things need to be changed. We really need to have a long, hard think and think outside the square because if we don't, we are going to constantly keep people. And as you said today, I'll wind it up, but as you said today, um, you know, those things, we need to get security clearances, right? How are those kids ever going? You're always going to have the lucky few, the privileged few of, of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids that didn't, exp which is not the common, that's not the norm. The norm is the flip side, unfortunately. So how do we get those kids out of that system? And once they're in it, how do we get them out of it? I've got some ideas. Um, and I think, but it, it will absolutely take governments to be thinking outside of the square and not in this punitive mind that we've got. And I think if anyone's interested in hearing those ideas, I think follow up with Carolyn because this is a real opportunity and I think we do have to be quite networked in our approach and make sure we are building on each other as we take an approach uh, forwards around these issues. Um, Kristen, um, as a last question, any general advice for women or people from historically marginalised groups looking to have a career in space? What should they do? What shouldn't they do? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. Yeah, um, so, so first off, I, I just want to the ambassador's point. Um, Australia really is a, a leader in WPS. Um, I learned WPS when I went to Afghanistan. And I saw it operationalized. Um, from from the Australian forces and the New Zealand forces there. Uh, then when the call came out uh, at the Pentagon to have a WPS representative, I raised my hand uh, because I saw the good it, it really could do. Uh, so I just want to say you know, thank you uh, for that. Um, so what to do? So I'm, I'm an aerospace engineer. I'm a rocket propulsion uh, engineer. Uh, don't, don't let them tell you no. I mean, that's, that's all on the short of it. Um, yeah, to get into the, the space community, um, it's, it's not an easy path always. Um, you know, just, um, you know, you have to put your nose to the grindstone and, and study and, and um, you know, try and, try and get into the room. Um, I think sometimes getting into the room is the first step and then kind of like inching your way up to the table and then getting a seat at the table is the next step. Um, and so that's kind of how I've always, I've always done things. Um, you know, trying to, to get your voice heard um, whether it's doing that extra little bit of volunteer time or raising your hand for extra things and getting there or, you know, studying a little extra hard or, you know, doing, you know, for the military, doing a little extra PT to get noticed. Um, you know, it's, it's all those different things. And, um, you know, in the engineering community, there, are, there aren't a lot of women. I have gotten the question of why would a woman even want to do that? Um, you know, and, and it's, you know, <laughs> It's a hard because I want to because I want to make you know I want to make uh, the rocket propulsion community better. I want to launch rockets. I want to provide uh, defense and work with my partners in, in the nation. So um, and and make the world a better place if I can. So so um, hopefully that that answers it. Uh, yeah, don't take no for an answer. Um, go out there and, and do good things. 
I love that. <laughs> I've interviewed uh, a lot of ambassadors and commanders and all kinds of amazing people across international affairs and that kind of resilience um, approach, you know, it, it can be hard to hear because we don't want to always just put up with it, but it, it certainly is a message that comes across a lot. And the last message I would probably leave you on is that, you know, in thinking about these issues, whether that be from gender or disability or for eth ethnicity or anything else, um, we really have to make sure that we are focusing on fixing systems um, as much as possible and not individuals. We don't want to just fix women. We don't want to fix disabled people. We don't want to fix, you know, we, we really want to be there from institutional backgrounds and intervention points that we can make a tangible, tangible difference uh, on a wide scale. Um, I'm going to hand over to our wonderful director, Professor Michelle Ryan, to lead us in some kind of closing remarks um, and comments before we wrap up this phenomenal panel. Michelle, over to you. Thank you so much, Elise. And I know I am not the person that was advertised on the tin, so I don't have a Nobel Prize. I'm not the vice chancellor of the university, but I hope I'll do. Um, thank you so much. Can everyone just join me in thanking this fantastic panel? I'm in such a fascinating discussion. And for me, I think what I was particularly impressed by was the sort of breadth and depth of the expertise on our panel. So we've got a First Nations and an academic research perspective. We've got an engineering and US Space Force perspective. We've got an ambassadorial and international relations perspective. And I, just, I was just reflecting on the fact that this panel is sort of truly emblematic of the sort of expertise that is needed if we are going to truly diversify the space sector. So I think this event tonight and the diversity at the Frontier Conference more generally, I think it comes at a really crucial time. Uh, we are really well positioned to shape this sort of growing industry in a way that aligns with the values that are important to us. Um, it, 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 in, a, in a way that sort of welcomes and seeks out diversity, both in the recognition of the, diver, uh, the benefits that diversity brings, so a sort of business case for diversity, but also really, and I think almost import, more importantly, the moral imperative that we have for diversity and inclusion as well. So I think here at the ANU, and I'm channeling Brian Schmidt here at the moment, so here at ANU, we're really uniquely placed to support government and to support industry in delivering on these goals of diversity and inclusion. I'm really proud to be the inaugural director of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership. We call ourselves Jewel. We call ourselves Jewelers as well. Um, but just supporting a team that's working really closely together to bring about world leading research, to bring about a translation of that research into practice, um, and to collaborate with industry and government in, in those sorts of ways. And the sort of advocacy we do in, in events like this one to just make sure that the national conversation is on track. And we do all of this work across a range of sectors, including the space sector as well. The ANU is also home to a really world-leading um, group of space researchers. We've got more than $130 million worth of world-class space infrastructure as well. ANU in space is, is really unique, um, in, in internationally really, um, but it's a cross-disciplinary organisation that connects the ANU space research with society's biggest challenges to really deliver positive impact as well. So it's so exciting for me to see our two institutes working together um, to lead the way on how we can improve diversity in space. We can connect governments, we can bring industry together, we can bring multiple, uh, multidisciplinary um, researchers to the table as well, um, and really look at how we can um, bring about change and develop effective solutions. And I think we've heard about some really concrete solutions here on the panel today, and I think we've had some very strong calls to action as well. So I just want to con congratulate the fantastic organisers of this um, event, Dr. Elise Stevenson, who's up here, um, but we've also got other people that are a little bit more behind the scenes um, at tonight's event, so Dr. Cassandra Steer and Professor Meredith Nash and all of the fabulous folks um, in the Jewel team that are wearing pink and grey t-shirts and are running around behind the scenes to get stuff done as well. So I think it, I'm really excited to see where this event takes us. I think this is not the end. It feels like the end of this event, but it's really the beginning of a much broader conversation. So maybe one more thanks for this amazing panel.
and I'll get you back up here, Elise. Thanks. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I think Michelle really, really said it, and our wonderful panelists. I mean, I, I really, I always wish that I had about two more hours that I could just drill down into their their brilliance and their expertise and their lived experience because this is really what it's what it's all about. Um, so just as some final final notes, we are very, very excited um, that a little bit later this month we'll be launching um, our podcast with Julia Gillard. Um, she has a podcast, a podcast of one's own, a room of one's own, um, which uh, is discussing all on diversity in space. And you'll get to hear a bit more from myself as well as from Julia Gillard as we dive into these issues into a little bit more detail. We also have a major study that is um, being undertaken currently. Um, so a big survey that you can participate in all around diversity and inclusion and accessibility and belonging in the space sector. And we will be sending out details for that after this event. And I really encourage you to please take part and please share it with everyone that you know, because as I mentioned before, we're really doing benchmarking um, here. This is a really important initial mapping exercise. Um, Finally, we are going to have a little bit of merch available at the Canapes and Drinks. Um, if you want cool uh, fluoro pink jewel mugs, uh, you know, signed by Julie Giller, not quite, but, you know, they look cool. Um, do check it out. And also I encourage you to exit through the rear doors um, because we're heading up to Ambush Gallery for our Canapes and Drinks. And we really hope that you can stick around. Um, there'll be a few jewel people directing you, but essentially go through the doors at the back and through the corridor. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to the ACT government. Thank you to the Australian Space Agency, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, to the US Embassy in Australia, to the Australian Academy of Sciences, to our amazing partners here, our speakers, and to all of you here tonight for joining us. And good night. Thank you.